So essentially this program is responding to what I perceived as a gap, what many perceive as a gap, which is to say, as I just told you, it's a young field, biodiversity informatics. Um, it's not been around very long. There's no textbook, you know, that big book that summarizes the state of the field and, and all of the accepted practices. There's no textbook that says biodiversity informatics. Way too new. Um, in fact, there's still not really seriously a place where you can go and study towards a degree in biodiversity informatics. In fact, right here, the University of the Western Cape is working towards developing such a program. Um, but suffice it to say that it's a young field. There aren't those accepted practices. It's not like statistics, where if you need to do a linear regression, there are 30 textbooks out there where you can see exactly how to do it. Maybe presented differently, but exactly how to do it. So this is what I just showed you. The last point is simply that there is a great need. It's a field of growing importance in biology, natural resources management. But again, there aren't any best practices. There aren't any um, statements of how to do things. So a bunch of us perceived that there really aren't many resources out there for training. Essentially, how do you learn? Um, for example, a field where I've worked quite a bit is ecological niche modeling. And I review dozens of papers every year that people are doing, where people are doing niche modeling. And it's kind of sad to say, but if people are doing niche modeling in one of the established labs, and there are maybe 10 of them around the world, they're doing it pretty much right. And people who are doing niche modeling outside of those labs, not always, but too frequently, are doing it wrong. That's just a fact of life. There's no good statement about how to do it. So essentially, the need for this program was centered on, on that gap, not just in niche modeling, but the whole field of biodiversity informatics. So personally, um, just to give you a little bit of background on me, uh, I'm an ornithologist. I was trained working with, with tropical birds. Um, my lab is at the University of Kansas, kind of right in the middle, right about where the O in of is. Um, it's kind of in the middle of nothing and close to nothing. It's kind of like where you guys are. Um, but it's a, it's a good base. Uh, which is to say there's a fair amount of freedom. And so what I've evolved into in 20 years at the University of Kansas is the view that really the best sort of training, when we talk about training resources, the real best training is a PhD, which is to say half a decade of intensive, deep study. So obviously we can't, we can't do broad, uh, PhD programs, at least not yet, but we, there certainly aren't resources to say, okay, all you guys, you thought you were here for a week, stay five years, right? So what I've always tried to do is essentially have a lab that's extremely diverse, and so these stars represent where I've had students from um, over the years. I've also taught a bunch of short courses in different countries. Um, and kind of most informative for me was a series of, of short courses that we did on ecological niche modeling uh, funded by GBIF back six, eight years ago. And essentially what those courses allowed me to do was to think about, well, how do you, how do you interact with people you don't know very well in a short amount of time? How do you communicate a maximum and yet get to a maximum number of people. And so I thought a lot about that over the years. Um, and I came to this idea that in person, in person is always best. 
Okay, we're going to be able to converse in the course of these, these uh, sessions, but also over dinner or over breakfast, and we can talk about an individual problem. Or if you have a problem with you know, zonation, you can talk with Raphael, whatever. Okay, but we're certainly going to go into a lot more depth because we're all here together. But we have a fair amount of new technology at hand that allows us to do a bit more. There are only, what, 23 of you uh, who are here with the hope of learning from three or four of us. Um, and that's not many people. So we can take advantage of technologies like YouTube, which is just a way of sharing videos. Um, I've been exploring a platform for subtitling videos. It's called .sub. It's pretty neat because if somebody does the transcription in English, we can then make the transcription and the video available. And for example, somebody from French-speaking Africa can come along and translate that as he or she listens, and then it's subtitled in French for everybody. So we're working on essentially building teams of people to do that subtitling, kind of on a crowdsourcing basis. We've done a test where we took a half hour video and made it available, and within a week it was available in Spanish, Portuguese, French, Arabic, and Chinese. So the possibility is there. We can do some neat stuff. Again, I'd much rather work in person, and I'd much rather have more people for PhDs. Okay? This is what can be done broadly and globally and relatively inexpensively. So that's the idea. Get groups of people together in person for training courses, but digital video gets captured of everything. The videos get published to YouTube. The English subtitles get added probably by me or one of my students. Via crowdsourcing, we translate the subtitles. And then we provide ancillary information like literature, like data for download via web links the University of Kansas knew what I use their institutional repository for, I probably would be out of a job. So then the next question was how to fund it. And uh, I found the JRS Biodiversity Foundation, which essentially funds projects oriented at biodiversity informatics with an eye towards conservation. Um, I submitted a proposal to them in January of 2012. It was funded in June of 2012. And essentially it funds everything I just told you about. It's bare bones, which is to say it's just barely enough for what we're ho hoping to get done. Um, but I think we'll be able to. Here's what we're planning to do. The introduction, most of that is done, okay, which is to say the talk I just gave you, what is biodiversity informatics? There's a whole 14 lectures on preparing scientific papers. There's a detailed set of lectures on preparing funding proposals. Um, some of you were present in Nairobi when we did courses on data cleaning, data publishing, and niche modeling, kind of the precursor to that is capturing the data. In January, most likely, we're going to get together in Ghana. It'll be a two-week course, and it'll be focused on essentially how do you go into an analog collection and make it digital. Strategy, design, capturing the images, translating images to data, and cleaning up the data. So that'll be Ghana in January. These three were done in Nairobi in February. Some of you were there. Guess what? That's where we are right now. That's the analysis course. It's essentially 
neat things that you can do with biodiversity data, not including niche modeling. Um, last week was a course on building biodiversity informatics institutions. We're planning a course on how to design and execute biodiversity inventories. Everything from the design and the data capture through to the actual field portion. We're talking about a course for developing national biodiversity diagnostics. And we're talking about a course on implementing biodiversity conservation efforts. And there's another one where we're talking about um, public health applications of biodiversity data. So lots to do in the next few years. Essentially, that's the approximate schedule done, done, uh, coming up in Accra for biodiversity data capture probably in Cairo for these two. Then we're thinking Cameroon or po and possibly Ethiopia for the last two courses. That's the approximate plan. And then into the future, wouldn't it be fun to extend this much more broadly? Let's just do all of organismal biology. Um, this fall I'm going to propose to the other professors in my department that we start capturing all of our graduate curriculum in digital formats, making them available. Maybe we get to the point where the students are listening to the lecture in advance of the class and coming to class to clarify, go deeper, discuss, debate, but with the class material already in hand. How many times will you give your biostats lectures in in the past and into the future, Tiago. Well, I actually have uh, I started this um, this strategy this semester. So I record the, the lectures before, and I only do uh, practical lessons when, Good. I, when I actually go Good. Uh, meet, meet, meet with them. So you don't want to give the biostats lectures 30 or 40 times? No. It's, okay. It's boring. <laughs> So the idea is if, if students get three hours per week with their professor, instead of hearing a board professor giving the lecture for the 30th time, maybe what they can do is see a reasonably up-to-date lecture. Maybe it's a year back, two years back. But instead, you come with the professor and you say, well, look, I didn't understand this point. Or can you help me with this, this problem? Um, I'd love to see in-person courses taught in other languages. My biggest failing as far as coming here to Africa is that my language abilities are English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So my apologies to the French speakers in the room. Um, but I would love to see this replicated without the need for subtitles, but replicated. And the neat thing is, it's not replicated we'd have a different set of experts. And so guess what? You'd be able to see Raphael lecture on conservation prioritization, but then some other expert who happens to speak French. You don't speak French, do you? No. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then where I'd really like to see this go is essentially leading into um, graduate study opportunities. And we're doing that informally, but making it formal requires a lot more money than, than we have right now. So this project includes a bunch of bits of, of technology. Uh, we have an online journal called Biodiversity Informatics, completely open access, no publication fees, carefully peer-reviewed, edited by me and a couple other professors. Um, but essentially, it's a forum for discussions about this field, which otherwise really doesn't have a home. Okay, And look at that. The first, uh, 
the first paper on the list in this one is a new era for specimen databases and biodiversity information management in South Africa. So a second thing that we have, most of you probably know about this, but this is a Facebook group. Um, if you get on Facebook and search for biodiversity informatics, no space, you'll find this group. It's been a really great way of sharing news and information. It's where we announce all of the courses and all of the opportunities that are part of this program. You can see, well, when I made this image, it was 810 members. I think now we're at 870 members. So it's a pretty rich forum for, for just interchange. Very informal, but very useful. So be sure to, to join that if you haven't already. This is probably the most important thing, and it only came really into existence a couple weeks ago. Um, it's a formal web page, biodiversity-informatics-training.org, uh, for this project. And essentially what, what a couple of us did, kind of me and some, some other friends who've worked a lot in biodiversity informatics, is we made a long list of all the topics, 80, 90 topics, that would be part of the full curriculum of biodiversity informatics. You know, if you, if you got together the experts on each of these fields, what would they talk about? And so we started this web page a year and a half ago. Um, we got some pretty bad advice about the platform. Uh, Kate, she's rolling her eyes right now. Kate suffered quite a bit with, um, with the early attempts not working. This is a good one to lose, so it doesn't matter. Um, Kate suffered quite a bit with getting the web page running. And finally, a month and a half ago, we scrapped the whole thing. We made it very simple. So you go to the curriculum page, and what you get is this mile-long web page that just has major topic, specific topic, and link to YouTube video. And so if, you, if your boss or your supervisor says, uh, here's a data set, I need you to clean it up, you can go to our data cleaning course and listen to three experts talk about it for a week. Um, or if you need to do some niche modeling, you have three other experts talking about that. And so essentially the whole set of subjects is laid out for you there. And as these courses happen, we fill in these links. That's all out there for your, for your use. Um, the links are on a YouTube channel. It's kind of redundant if you're watching the web page. But uh, a lot of people have ended up. You can see there are 109 then, and I think now it's 120 subscribers. Um, but that way, whenever something comes open, Whenever we put something up on, on YouTube, you see it immediately. And that's kind of the program. That's what uh, basically I and a whole bunch of friends, uh, experts and counterparts are setting out to do. It's going to take three and a half, four years to do start to finish. Um, <coughs> If there's anything I'm grumpy about with the program, it's that my wife has made clear to me that this couple of months away from home each year is my field work for the year. Because I get one month of field work per year. It's not a formal prenuptial agreement, but it pretty much was. Um, and so this is my field work, so to speak. Uh, this is my time away from home. Um, but the program works basically thanks to really good experts who are volunteering their time, uh, take a week away from their homes, come in, work with you guys, um, share a little bit of their expertise, um, and hopefully it's a two-way street. Hopefully some collaborations develop, hopefully some interchanges develop. I mean, it's always good to meet new communities of people. 
Any questions about the program? 